Welcome back to The Extract. I'm Kyle Meyer, and next to me is, uh, is wow. Uh, this was totally cool uh, when we got this phone call uh, a week or two ago saying that, uh, that Richard Sanford was coming into town to talk shop, and uh, my gosh, my eyes lit up. Oh, thanks, uh, yeah, What a pleasure Thank you so uh, to much. have you here. I want a handshake. Yeah. Um, this, is, this is truly amazing stuff, and we could literally spend an hour, which I'm sure you have in the past, uh, discussing just every... Oh, wow, this is a lot. We're going to try and do this in 12 minutes, so bear with us. But we could literally spend uh, two hours talking about Richard's history, talking about the importance of, uh, of Richard and, uh, and, and Mike Benedict and some guy, these guys to, to where we are as a, as a wine drinking community, not just in California, but in America today. I, I, I can't overplay the significance of what you brought to the table oh, wow. to us in the early 70s. It's completely legit. And I'm coming from a mid-generational standpoint, i.e. Not, not your generation and not the current millennial, but like the tweener generation mm -hmm. that saw the emergence of this area, mm -hmm. as opposed to just like, oh, Santa Rita Hills, eh, who doesn't know Santa Rita Hills? Yeah. Right? Like, you know, like the cats coming up now. That's true. They're like, oh yeah, Santa Rita Hills. Oh, oh Santa Rita Hills, oh yeah, Santa Rita yeah. Bay. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, and we were making Pinot Noir before Sideways. I know. You know? <laughs> uh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thank you, that was very thoughtful. So, so welcome it. aboard. Thank you. And, 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 and when we get started, I just want to spend a couple minutes uh, just in the start. For the folks mm -hmm. home that, that that may not know, um, uh, you, Mike Benedict, craziness. Um, quick few minutes about how this came to fruition. You know, I, I mean, I've heard I know the story before, but a lot of people, folks. Well, um, maybe I'll tell you the very quick story that yeah. uh, um, I had studied uh, geography at UC Berkeley and became interested ultimately in the geography of wine because. Um, Actually, it goes back to having been drafted out of Berkeley, gone to Vietnam, coming back a pacifist, deciding I needed to be involved in agriculture and thinking probably perishable agriculture or not, but this got better with age, and I had been introduced to a beautiful Volnay, and I thought, you know, why can't I replicate the Volnay in America? Yeah. And so I went back in the climate records for 100 years comparing Burgundy with America, and found that uh, it wasn't really where you were north or south, it was where you were marine-wise, mm. uh, east or west, in the transverse mountain range in those valleys behind Santa Barbara. And sure enough, there's a, uh, about a degree a mile as you go inland at that point. And uh, so I chose this band of climate to locate a vineyard in. I was very excited about doing this. I was in my 20s and had to go out and find investors. And uh, for me, Kyle, though, uh, it was a healing experience after the war. Yeah, and yeah. I drove around the tractor getting the vineyard established, made the first wine, and wow, it worked. You know, so uh, <laughs> it was really very cool. And uh, we lived for eight years with gas lights, no electricity on this old ranch. It was a 600-acre bean farm. So it was a wonderful period. Yeah, and you and you guys were insane. I mean, this is you know, just, we were. just to start from scratch, and actually, right at the start, right, wasn't like more like a like Cabernet and Riesling, right? Wasn't that kind of like the in vogue type stuff? And you were experimenting well, with that. that. And then the point was, was there a fear of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir right when you first started? No, putting sticks the in idea there? was to plant Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Cabernet, Merlot, and Riesling. Yeah. Uh, we bought the Riesling Cabernet. Uh, from Uriel Nielsen on the Tepesque Mesa. Got it, yeah. Oh, the other one of the very first plants. And the Pinot Noir and Chardonnay that we wanted weren't uh, available, and so we ordered up that, um, the cuttings, or rootings, and then planted those the following year, right. 1972. Right. And you got those from Wente, right? Uh, where did those came from? Or where did the you get Chardonnay those is a Wente clone. Yeah. And uh, the Pinot Noir is from, uh, well, there are two. There's the Napa. Gamay mm -hmm. and the Mount Eden clone right. that Paul Masson brought to this country and planted on uh, Saratoga. Right. Legit Mount Eden clone. Like, even before it was like all UC Davis out and that kind of stuff, huh? Before or it was. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So what's, so, in, what's in the ground right now, San Fernando Benedict, is, is still boy, those, you know, some of those are still uh, those original uh, plantings, maybe. Huh? There are uh, maybe, I think, 20 or 30 acres of original plantings. Yeah. And the place is now owned by the Tirolato family from yeah. Chicago, and they 
have replanted some additional acres of different mm. super duper clones. Was so. it was it was it because well you were there from the start, but was there a, was there a point in time in, in your career where you started looking around and you're like, oh my gosh, people are figuring this out. Like was there like a spot where like you know the Santa Rita Hills detonated in your mind? Was it like in the early '90s that people kind well, of figured I'll it out? Or I think it? so. You know, it took a few vintages. And uh, I'll always remember that uh, that uh, I would go out marketing our wine. I'd go to Chicago and go to New York, and I'd say, "Hey, you guys, you know wh what we're doing here in the West." And everyone was looking to Europe for satisfaction and quality wine. Mm. And I was always saying, "Hey, people in LA would go. We're going to the wine country. They'd fly right over our head and go to Napa <laughs> Valley. You know, and I thought, right. oh my God, hey. we're going to the other wine country. Yeah, you know? yeah. so." But little by little, with all this proselytizing, and maybe the awareness of your generation to suggest that, uh, you know, you can have an elegant wine with a screw top, for instance. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you don't have to be mired in tradition. Mm. Uh, that, uh, hey, uh, maybe good wine is made locally mm -hmm. and not be embarrassed about it. Right. And pretty soon, mm. hey, wait a minute. We're proud of our wines here. And so right. now I think we have become the wine region for Los Angeles, you know. As yeah. you know, Kyle, it's the largest wine market in the world. I'm really excited that people are now proud of their wine region. Right. It's, and, and, you know, I've thought, oh, it's taken so long to get this place established, and don't people get it? And, but you know what people tell me in 35 years to have all this happen is really fast. It's remarkable. And all these young people, what gives me great satisfaction are all these young people who really want to make their point in wine are coming to the Santa Rita Hills to try their hand, hand at it. And it's exciting. There's a dynamic that's going on there and people planting new clones and new trellising and weird right. stuff. And right. you know, they're pushing boundaries and that's exciting. Part of the evolution of an appellation that there's a very good chance it wouldn't have been without your assistance. Well, you know, somebody has to start. Right. <laughs> so, uh, to look for the team. You know what? I was really sort of shy about the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, but then when I was inducted into the Winemakers Hall of Fame, and the I first, thought, right? I thought, right. Uh, well, first in our region. Yeah. But I thought, um, well, if you're selected by your peers to have that honor, well, maybe. It was a pioneer. Maybe it was a <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so but, with, with, with uh, essentially what's, what constitutes a 20-year head start on the rest of the pack. Oh, yeah. N now, yeah. now you have Almarosa. It takes that but, length of time to get the style set, you know. Yeah. And so now these wines are reflecting the style that we've created over 40 years. Well, th that was my next question is, is since, since you were like ahead of the game, right? What, what have you learned over that period of time that informs the Almarosa label now? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You know, like, what, uh, um, what, what, what's like the standard, like, oh, there's no way you do that. And someone rolling in and be like, oh, I'm going to do this. And you're like, ah, you're not easy. Um, I would say uh, respecting the land. And I think that all these great varieties uh, reflect the place more than any other great varieties. Pinot Noir particularly, reflection of place. Um, <clears throat> the first vineyards I planted were on very gravelly, loam, very mm -hmm. well drained, and the successive vineyards, the Incantata and Rinconata, mm -hmm. have been successively more clay-like. Mm -hmm. um, that Chardonnay, by the way, is from the Havali vineyard, and there is a tropical fruit character to the Santa Barbara Chardonnay that's so appealing. Chardonnay was the grape variety that put Santa Barbara County on the map. Mm -hmm because the Napa guys were buying grapes from our region and up trucking them up quality and not telling anybody. <laughs> and so one year, 1985, uh, Behringer and uh, Kendall Jackson and uh, came and bought all the available vineyard acreage from uh, uh, Prudential and Bank of America. Oh, so, anyway, you know, that's the ups and downs of the wine business in, right. in Santa Barbara. So I called Michael Mondavi, or Tim Mondavi, and said, can't we buy a little Sauvignon Blanc? And he said, oh, no, we view you as a competitor now. So, oh, uh, you know, it changed the whole character of yeah. the way people were working with a handshake. And yeah. it, 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 you know, it pumped it into big business. No, it went, it went from Remember? you helping a brother out to, to uh, hey, knock uh, it off. Close the gate, <laughs> right? 
<laughs> you awesome. saw that period happen. Yeah. You know? yeah. And so yeah. it became apparent to me that if we were going to be in the business, we had to plan our own vineyards. Yeah. Because no one was, you know, they're not secure. Yeah. You can't have security in grapes. Mm-hmm. It takes grapes to be in the wine business until someone invents a different way to do it. Yeah. The, uh, well, speaking of 85, when did you plant in Havali? Uh 83. 83. 83 or 85. I this, this is a little stealth vineyard. Not too many people know about this site. This was like on the down low for a number of years. It has but, been. But yeah. in fact, we're talking, you know, 30, this is the original plant. We, also. this is the vineyard that produced the Barrel Select Chardonnay at Sanford Winery. Oh, okay. um, I've met people who've been conceived over that wine. Right. <laughs> You know, it's pretty special. I would know, but the say. problem is those kids now are like, you know, 25, 30 years they old. They are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, not moving not on. Is, uh, so, so getting. Pinot Noir. So, so, the Pinot Noir is, in fact, a, a selection uh, of, of different vineyards. So, basically, with your experience, you've been able to sit there and go, like, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one, right? Mm-hmm. And that's kind of essentially what this wine is. Well, the, uh, the cool thing is that uh, over time, uh, there's been a sort of a sorting out of uh, different clonal materials. This is always a bit confusing. Uh, you know, Kyle, we make Pinot Noir. We would never blend Pinot Noir with any other grape variety. Mm. But we have different clones available. And a clone would come from a different vineyard and different sites. It comes that if the clones, the plant materials come from Europe and come to Davis to a mother block. Uh, they're grown for a few years and assigned a number. And then uh, once the virus is free, we might want to make sure we don't infect uh, other vineyards. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're released to the, to the nurseries and they grow the nursery stock. And so we have all this different clonal material to plant in the vineyards. And then uh, different sites, uh, different uh, um, exposures, different soils. And uh, luckily for our region, as we go east or west, a lot of different climate zones. So yeah. there are all these variables going into the wines now. This is really a reflection of the beauty of Pinot Noir as a food beverage. This I'm very proud of as a high, high quality for a modest price. Yeah. This is in the low 30s on the shelf. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm really proud of the value of this wine. Gorgeous wine. <clears throat> and, the fa- and the fact that it's not to this, not to that, I think it perfectly encapsulates what can be done in Santa Rita Hills. You know, uh, I think it's elegance. also important to point out that this is not an opaque wine. No. You know, Pinot Noir, remember Michael Broadbent, that great mm-hmm. uh, writer? He said, you know what, you ought to be able to read a newspaper through Pinot Noir yep. or through yep. Burgundy. Yep. And you can't do that with Cabernet or Syrah or some of these other dense wines. So that there's an elegance to it, you know, that really works with the day's food, I think. Yeah. Mm. Often it's blueberry, uh, sometimes blackberry, but uh, a lot of berry components. Yeah, you get a lot of dark fruit character from here, but mm-hmm. still with a lift. The wine's not heavy at all, which you would well, perceive the berry characters as creating something with more base that's notes. But the beauty of the acid of our region. You know, mm-hmm. it's got a brightness to it. You know, you got a 20-year head start, but you can make pretty good Pinot Noir. For uh-huh, uh-huh, thank <laughs> you. Uh-huh. And then I want to try the sparkling wine real quick. This mm-hmm. is, um, I'm going to take a quick little rinse here. Because yeah. this, I, I, didn't, I didn't know you were doing this. Well, you know what? I've never been one of saying what we're going to do. <laughs> I've always liked to do it and then present it. You know, right. Kyle, I think that we have a lot of people now who are telling us what they're going to do. I figured I'll do it and then share it. Then let you know later, yeah. And I'll tell you, um, I recognize that this region, the Santa Rita Hills, sings for sparkling wine. It, Great it, acidity, it, it, it's, Chardonnay, it's just the perfect site. But I told you earlier, it's very hard to make any money in the sparkling wine business because the French came over in the mid 80s and bought a lot of land in Napa. Yeah. Um, and we were talking about what great value for the last 30 years. It's been the same price, but yeah. it's hard to, to be a winemaker and make money doing it. But I've known the potential for quality. And now with uh, Mr. Bob Zorick of Houston, 
its involvement in Alma Rosa gives us the ability to make sparkling wine as it should be. Yeah. It's a two-year protocol of winemaking so yeah, that yeah. we can have the wine in the barrel for eight months or so, an entourage in the bottle for a year, and so have the wine available two years after the harvest. So often I think people try to push it to have it the year after, yeah. because we always want to celebrate. Right. You know? <laughs> uh, but the really uh, wonderful thing is in this wine, it's half from the Havali Chardonnay at the, uh, in the Havali Ranch and half from the uh, Pinot Blanc in the Encantada. But there's a brightness of acid that really holds it together beautifully, I think. Really gorgeous wine. And knowing that it's you know all you know premium old vine material for the most part uh, in this wine. Oh, the Hobbley is like thirty year old, thirty five. Thirty year old Chardonnay. I guess we planted the um, Encantada in two thousand. Two thousand. Yeah. yeah. Mm, that's delicious. Good breakfast, wine, Kyle. You know, it's almost like you know what you're you doing. Ah, uh, <laughs> you know what? It's uh, it's really been fun to to try, and I'm I'm really proud that. Uh, my wife came along for the first vintage in 1976, and mm -hmm. uh, this year we'll celebrate our 39th vintage together. I haven't missed one, so mm -hmm. it's been really exciting. Okay, we can keep going on. We're going to stop, because uh, this could get out of control. <laughs> um, so, Richard Sanford, holy crap, thank you for coming by today. You're it welcome. was a true honor. Thank you very much. All right, no, appreciate it, and uh, yeah, record, yeah, tape this one. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers.